Well, good day or good evening whenever you happen to be listening to this. Coach here. How you doing? Man, I'm glad to have you along for a few minutes. Covering a topic that, uh, well, a lot of people want, but I understand, you know, not everybody has. But, you know, when it comes to landscape in and around pools, there is not only a pre-landscape, but there's also a major league post-landscape. Depending on how you approach it, and that's what we're talking about here today. Uh, you really can attain a lush, even semi or even tropical landscape around that giant cement pond and keep maintenance for you and your pool guy to a minimum. I'm also going to share uh, options where you can attain more natural swimming options, should you decide to go that way, that are interesting and certainly growing in popularity. If you like what you see and hear, please follow along on the podcast every week. You can always reach out if you have questions after this or any other landscape question simply by emailing me at youryardcoach at gmail.com. You know something? I would really appreciate that kind of engagement. The podcast popularity appreciates it, but most importantly, I appreciate it. And I really appreciate you following along. I really do. So, no pun intended, let's take a dip into pool landscapes, some of the options, some tactical landscape approaches, and commonsensical themes which reduce maintenance for you. Hey, I'm Matt, you can call me coach. Every Friday I bring with me landscape DIY education, concepts and theories, ideas and solutions, so you guys can go out and tackle a landscape project yourself Get professional results, save a whole lot of money in the process, and in this day and age, be a lot more self-reliant. Man, after a 20 plus year career in the green industry, I'm bringing with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I wanna share with you guys, the new, modern, educated, self-reliant homeowner of today. All right, welcome back. First, a realization right out of the gate. I know not everybody has a swimming pool, duh. I also know that all pools are not the usual cement in the ground, rebar, gunite, plaster type pools. There are drop-in versions on sand, sand bases and the above ground ones as well. Now those above ground ones, the landscape situation isn't gonna be as critical as the drop-in and the cement ones but you still have to pay attention and you still have to make some selections and some landscaping decisions that will greatly affect the versatility and the usability of those above ground pools. I also know that those who have gone through the pool construction process really come out on the other side going, wow, nice pool, but holy crap, look at our yard. Now what do we do? Oftentimes, the pre-existing landscape is usually torn to absolute hell, and underground elements are usually destroyed. I would like to call your attention to something that I preach all the time here on this podcast and the YouTube channel, and that is planning. Planning from the homeowner's perspective when it comes to pool installation and pool landscaping. Planning, everybody. Planning. Thinking more than just one page ahead is really going to eliminate or mitigate a lot of headache, a lot of throw your hands up, a lot of pulling your hair out in order to move forward after that big hole in the ground has been filled and you can now go dive in. You know something? Starting from the beginning, and most pool sales people will tell you this, you can negotiate with your pool contractor to repair and replace all the damage that they are going to do to that existing landscape. Damage to the drainage system, certainly damage to any underground irrigation, lighting cable, gas lines, electrical lines, all of these things that may be running in and around that really have to be addressed. And they have to be addressed not only during dig, but they have to be addressed afterwards as well. Or you can have someone like Coach 
have a landscape designer or a contractor waiting in the wings to kind of show up and walk you through the process and either keep up with the damage and repair it as it's done at various stages of the pool construction, or at least consult with you as the pool construction is evolving to tell you kind of what to do and how to go about doing it. Because there are phases in these construction things that you have to be on top of it because eight o'clock on Thursday morning, they're doing the dig and they tear the hell out of the place. Friday, the dig is well done and they're starting to throw the basket in or they're waiting for the pool to be delivered and craned up over the house and dropped in place. And what are you gonna do about all those destroyed drainage and irrigation ends? Unless you have negotiated that, unless you've negotiated that with your contractor, you're gonna be left to figure it out. And man, have I got those phone calls. So kind of going into it and knowing what the end game is at the end of the construction process is a huge load off the mind if you have the game plan in place ahead of time. Many folks do not. They're so exuberant about getting the $70,000 cement pond placed in the backyard. They don't really consider, unless it's brought to their attention, they don't always consider what about all the destroyed elements of the landscape including plants and other stuff, but we'll get into that in a few minutes. Many pool contractors, not all of course, I'm not gonna lump them all, are there at your job site to install the pool and the effect the construction has on the remaining hardscape or greenscape is really not their concern. They, they kind of assume, now remember the sales team and the construction team many times might be different people, but they don't care about your irrigation that much unless you have placed it into the contract that they are to pay attention to it. That is unless you make it that concern and a concern around the contract that you actually signed with the company. Once again, that salesperson that you dealt with might not even be there during any phase of the construction. A good one would be to double check and make sure everything's going well. But I guarantee you in this day and age, chances are they're two totally different people. So. Taking the approach of being the preemptory strike, shall we say, that they will cap off all existing irrigation. They will, they will flag and locate all drainage lines when they do their dig. They will let you know what they did with live wire electrical. Or they have to deal with the gas. I mean, there's just no way you can just dig through a gas line and keep moving on. That's not gonna be the case, but those things are gonna have to be capped and taken care of. When and where to rerun that drainage, that irrigation, that lighting cable, that is going to be the challenge of the homeowner or the homeowner's delegate, maybe a landscape professional. And that landscape professional or you have to be on site and ready to go. Because like I said, eight o'clock in the morning, the hole is gonna be totally different than four o'clock in the afternoon. They may be backfilling in and around the gunite edge. You don't know. You have to keep up on it or you can really be behind the curve. You really can. And running irrigation line in and around the other pool plumbing is the thing that you can do. You can actually zip tie some of those things to existing pool pipes that are going in so you can really stabilize that smaller and much more flexible type of irrigation line. What you really want to accomplish is you want to have irrigation lines and drainage lines, electrical, gas lines, whatever they may, might be, you have to have them in at a particular time when it doesn't interrupt and it's not going to be interrupted at the particular phases of that pool construction. Very, very important. The other thing is, is once you get that thing in, once you get those lines back in, you need to turn on the water and you need to make sure by 1000% that there is no splits, leaks, or anything else. Turn on those lateral lines, turn on pressurized lines if that's what you have, and double check that everything is solid, 1000% solid, because the last thing you want is to have something go bad. And the other thing, I don't wanna leave this particular part of the segment out, but 
make sure that those lines are somewhat supported in place because when they start backfilling with a bobcat bucket and stuff, there's a lot of sudden weight and a lot of shifting that can go on to much more flexible irrigation lines. And you don't want them getting all flexed out and having connecting points rupture. So make sure, make sure those things are tied off or staked off, or whatever it has to be to stabilize them. Okay, so if you are the proud owner of a new or existing swimming pool, and I have been one, I have been an owner of a swimming pool. I will never have one again but I did have one for many years. You get to the point where the greenscape selections really play a vital role in how much maintenance time will be created. Now, all of this is grounded in where you are at as far as a growing zone in the world. Pools are installed north, south, east, and west, all over the world for the most part. But a common landscape theme can run through plant selection, and it's basically rooted in clean, safe, commonsensical selections. But as always, the plant part will be the last thing you tackle. Let's take a brief look at the hardscape. Some pool contracts will involve an expanded paved decking area in cement or segmented block, whatever you have decided. But many times, many times, part of the general contract is having a three or four foot sidewalk band around the pool itself. And beyond that, expanding out towards maybe your patio or your pool house or whatever you're doing, that will be on you. It is all checkbook dependent, it really is. I mean, there are good pool companies that will expand it as far as your checkbook can go. But a consistent decking theme, you know, having whatever you've selected on that initial three or four foot band around the pool should probably continue wherever it goes or it's really gonna look kind of funny. The other thing is, is a good durable surface, good pool decking should extend all the way from where folks come and go, going to and from the pool, whether that be the master bedroom or the family room or both. You don't wanna go be traipsing out across wet grass or dirt or mud or bark or anything else. It really needs to be a good durable surface for barefoot travel. Very, very important. And that those surfaces are not glass slick. They're not finished in a way where like a polished store floor would be. It has to have a little bit of roughness to it for good stability and good walking. Also consider tapping into the channel drainage that oftentimes is put into pool decking. They have the little channel drains, both narrow and sometimes a little bigger, depending on what environment you're in. A lot more rain, bigger channel drains. And part of your house drainage system should tie into that and evacuate that pool decking water away from the pool. Obviously the pool surface and the coping and the initial decking is going to be just slightly higher than everything else if done correctly. That way water, even if it overflows, is gonna flow away from the pool. And generally that flow partially is gonna be going towards the house. So that's where the channel drain kind of comes in. Well, most of the time that channel drain is gonna to run to the end of the cement or the block decking. And that is it. What are you gonna do with it after that? That will be up to you or your landscape professional. And you gotta get it away from the pool area. You don't want it just dumping at the edge of the sidewalk. And then what? Now you have a soaking wet mud hole where not too much is going to want to grow. And it's gonna be sometimes chemicalized water, which you don't wanna get a whole bunch of in and around certain plants. So consider tapping into and evacuating from that channel drain, evacuating out and through the fence and wherever you can take it. It's a real good, complete way of addressing post pool installation. The other thing is, is when you're talking about irrigation again, oftentimes people put in pools and then there'll be this bulkhead wall on the back side of the pool that uh, maybe it'll be a raised planter bed. Maybe it'll be where a diving board is or whatever, but there's going to be landscape up in there. Make sure you get a sleeve of either actual PVC piping or some type of sleeving through that bulkhead wall so that you can easily run lighting cable and you can run drip irrigation or poly pipe irrigation or PVC pipe irrigation through there really easy. Nothing worse than drilling a hole through a brand new bulkhead. Just you don't know what's in there and you'd rather run the pipe through knowing full well you're not going to hit maybe a gas line because you have a fancy burning 
urn that's going to be up there. Do it ahead of time. Very, very important. Okay, let's move on to some of the fun stuff. Let's talk about the greenscape. I have always found plant selection will dictate maintenance time. Do you agree with me there? There are some plants that you hardly ever have to touch, and there are other ones, man, you got to pay attention to them. Seems like every month. But nothing more maintenance, heavy maintenance requirements as your weekly lawn mow. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having lawn in and around pool decking. I mean, it's a nice, clean, relatively safe type of landscaping where people can throw down towels and enjoy the sun and in and out of the pool. Just remember that, you know, you do have the mowing and you do have the, the cleaning off every week, which is, yeah, you know, that's, that's just part of the game. The whole goal is to minimize pool cleanup, though pool cleanup and maintenance. Unless you are delegating that all out to some other pool professional. Some pool filtering nowadays, I mean, good lord, the filtering and skimming systems nowadays compared to even the pool that I had back in the 90s, they are pretty freaking slick. Between timed pool wall skimmer jets that actually push debris into and around and down to a particular drain that sucks it all up and cleans it all up, pretty fancy stuff that's out there. Plus the water generated Polaris type of uh, cleaners that are down in there. They really cut down on a lot of maintenance for folks. But you know something? Depending on what kind of plants you have decided or you have already put in, you still got to empty those skimmer baskets. You still got to empty that Polaris bag. You got to do all those kinds of things. And very, very important to kind of think about your plant selection so that you don't overdo it. Because it does put a bigger strain on your filter system. And depending on what type you have, whether it's a salt generated filter or a diatomaceous earth filter, I'm sure there's more ones that are even fancier than that now. I have always, I have always kind of leaned not only myself, but my clients as well towards smaller. Smaller is better when it comes to trees and shrubs and researching evergreen is not always the best route because some evergreen trees are just a mess. In some cases, deciduous trees can actually be cleaner than some evergreen trees. Some of the evergreens tend to drop leaves kind of off and on all year long and then they may have a blooming period and they may have a seed dropping period and i know a lot of deciduous trees have that too but there are some selections one thing is if you're going to get an evergreen tree and you're in the zone to tolerate it make sure the leaves are as big as possible not little micro leaf crap not like locust tree leaves or even birch tree leaves, those kinds of things just, man, they're so small. They're so, once they get waterlogged and they sink to the bottom of the pool, good Lord, they can clog up a system really fast. So flowering trees, both evergreen and citrus, can cause the biggest problems. Then flower drop and often the potential following fruit drop can really wreak havoc to not only the, the pool cleaning system itself, but also the wood deck, the cement decking, the paver decking, whatever you have, because some flower and fruit, man, they will stain up, stain up a patio area around a pool really, really bad. Those beautiful flowering trees look great for a short period of time until they start dropping. And then the spring breeze comes up and then all those flower stuff starts blowing all around the place. So consider plant selections, trees especially, being very, very careful, careful of what you're getting. Consider where most of your prevailing winds come from. That's another thing. And I guess you can always have a, a nice pool cover put on top of the either mechanical or manually placed cover put on top of a pool. And that would probably eliminate most of this. But most people don't have that. They don't. They may have it over a hot tub, but they don't always have it over a large swimming pool. So those spring those spring winds and the summer winds. Is there other construction going on in the neighborhood that's going to create dust and mess and in getting into the pool all the time? Things to consider. You know, one tree, a deciduous tree actually, that uh, I would try to shy away from and tell you the same thing. And it's very popular in most zones like 8 through 11, and that's the crepe myrtle. A really beautiful tree in its own right. But this tree has many stages of mess. And if, uh, if you are going to use it, if you really have to use it, make sure it is situated far away from the, the pool itself. 
between uh, flower and seed drop, leaf drop in the fall, and sometimes those crepe myrtles, man, they can get a nasty, nasty case of aphid on some of the new growth. And then that aphid honeydew stuff drops down onto in and around pool decking and stuff. And what a sticky mess that you're having to power wash off to keep things nice and sanitary. Because then the honeydew attracts sooty mold fungus and it's just bleh. So don't get me wrong, I think as a species, crepe myrtle is a beautiful tree in its right environment. Just not really close to the pool because it, it can be kind of messy. Between that flower drop and leaf drop and the surrounding environment, like I said, say for instance, you know, you and the missus or you and the mister are going to put a pool in, but the smiths next door have these massive redwood trees or a big sycamore tree or a huge sweet gum, liquid amber type of trees. And that is gonna play a huge role in how it's gonna affect your new investment, it really is. So consider the surroundings as well. Consider your backyard neighbors, your side yard neighbors, and come fall time, man, maybe it's really worth the investment to put a cover over it so that you can kind of just blow off the top of the cover and not have to worry so much about what's getting in the pool. So small trees and shrubs mingled with color of one kind or another will attain, you know, that level of lushness and prettiness and really mitigate the messiness to a point it takes minutes and not hours to keep up with. This way you won't have the worry of, oh, I can remember one job that I had where some reason they thought it'd be a great idea to put in seven or nine massive redwood trees. They dropped them in in 24, 24 inch box specimens. And in 10 years, 10 years, the bulkhead of the pool wall was actually bulging because of uh, root challenge. And holy crap, man, the tree companies came in and they had to take all the redwood trees out. They had to carefully carefully get a stump grinder up in there and grind it down, then dig down and actually excavate all the soil out of this raised bed area and then chop out the roots that were there. And then a pool company came in and had to re-straighten that bulkhead wall. Needless to say, when I came on board, yeah, there was not gonna be any trees of that size and of that caliber going back in there. I think we ended up putting in no trees and we had some other Oh, I think we had some New Zealand flax, small New Zealand flaxes, some vines on trellis and much more containable and less invasive and damaging type of uh, plant material. For those of you like in zones eight and higher, many varieties of palm that stay small can offer you a clean, lush, tropical look to in and around your pool, provided that you know your selection can stand up to the the zone that you're living in. I do not suggest, and I, I did a little research on this, and there's still people out there that think that fan palms, queen palms, majesty palms, they're all good choices. They're good choices, just not really close to the pool. Away from the pool, and that's what you want, okay. But up and close and around a pool, all those palms are gonna be is giant telephone poles in five to 10 years. All the foliage is gonna be neck-wrenchingly high to see, and they're really not gonna offer a lot of tropical feel except from a distance away. Uh, you can imagine, you know, you have your fence and then you have your pool and your backyard environment and you have these, I don't know, five, seven, telephone poles sticking up out of the backyard and you got the foliage that's 20 30 feet tall up in the air and you have to hire professionals now to shimmy up those telephone poles and trim off the fronds and keep them looking neat i can remember being with some friends earlier this year and the neighbor behind them has probably i don't know nine or nine or maybe even more big queen palms and we're talking trunks that are literally the size of telephone poles and foliage that extends above their two-story home. And although it's pretty from a distance, it doesn't serve a purpose at ground level. So consider, and I'll tell you about some palm selections here in just a minute. Another control that can be important is using shrubs, trees, and perennials that are not high in the bee attracting 
be attracting realm. Enjoying the pool environment does not need really a heavy bee population flying about. Another thing is bees, not only just honeybees, but also hornets, wasps, all kinds of things can be attracted to water, especially in the hot, drier, water scarce climates that are around. You know, having that pool cover over when not in use can reduce by a large degree a lot of drowned bee populations. And I've seen lots of pools, including my own at one time. You know, the bees would come in and just literally try to to land on the side of the pool and then they would slip off the the tile and into and they were done. So a little bit of forethought. Especially if you have someone that's kind of you know, bee sensitive. No one likes to get stung by bees, but my Lord, if you have some kind of allergic reaction to them, my God, holy cow. So kind of consider that as well. Now I realize that you cannot have perfection everywhere you go, especially when it comes to, you know, the backyard pool landscape, you know, unless you choose to make your pool enclosed in a, in a lanai, pool lanai type of situation, like many people do in the deep South states here in the U S then landscaping kind of revolve around some in-ground planting, but probably more container plantings in and around the lanai of the pool area and not ground. But you will still have outdoor landscaping that's going to create shade and other things and some considerations have to be made there. So hey, I'd like to go through this list of pool, tree, and plant and shrub selections for you. You can take notes if you want but uh, you can also just replay it or hit record on your phone and listen to it that way. But uh, when it comes to palms, I'm generally only about four. Now, remember, I came from zone 9B in the Central Valley of Northern California. So, yes, we had queen palms. Yes, I had to, on occasion, plant queen palms, but I'm not a fan. So, Here's my palm selection. A windmill palm, dwarf canary island date palm, sago palms, Mediterranean fan palm. Those are really all the palms that I ever used. Some other selections is a dwarf especially, but uh, maintain standard versions of citrus. The standard ones I would suggest are a little further away from the pool because you can get uh, some bee attraction to it. But for the most part, if you keep up on it, it's fairly low maintenance and they just look damn good in and around a pool situation if they are the backdrop in the back corner somewhere. Other versions of cypress, both false cypress and regular cypress, hinoki cypress and cultivars of that are nice and clean. They're soft to the touch. They don't attract bees and they're really low maintenance. Arborvitae for backdrop, wind screens, privacy screens, Fruitless olive tree, Swan Hill is one that comes to mind. Wilson Eye is a semi-dwarf and it does get fruit, so I don't suggest that one, but Swan Hill out in the, the California area was huge popular in and around pools. Some holly, but mostly those are in the shrub variety like Vomitora shillings, those, those kinds of holly, very clean. You just have to kind of hedge them up as you see fit. Another evergreen that I will suggest is uh, the magnolia. The smaller versions of them. I think uh, Little Gem is a fantastic user in and around pools. And then evergreens of like the dwarf spruce, even dwarf pine and cypress varieties like I mentioned. And I know the comments are going to be coming about pine, coach, pine, really? The dwarf pines, okay? Like a, the dwarf columnar scotch pine or the mugo pine, those kinds of pines. I'm not talking anything bigger. Okay, shrubs and perennials, not a lot on my list. Smaller ornamental grasses. Uh, if you do things like uh, penicetum, you know, the fountain grass, you know in 90% of the places they're going to be annuals. So just treat them as an annual. And you can do them containerized. Now around the pool that I had, yeah, I had them in containers. Holy crap, were they huge. They were huge. They were four feet tall and four feet wide. And I had to water them every day at the end of the season because they were so big and they took up so much water, they needed daily attention. But if they were in the ground, the maintenance and attention would be somewhat limited. If you do go penicetum, enjoy those beautiful little fuzzy flowing in the wind seed heads, but trim them off early on so that they don't go blowing around and reseed themselves. Try 
at all costs to stay away from all pompous grass, either the dwarf, but especially the regular. They are just not something that you want to get involved in in a pool setting. The leaves will serrate you like a butcher knife. The flower stalks, the seed heads, they're going to blow stuff around and you'll have pompous grass in other places. Just not a great choice. Achillea, great flowering perennial. Boxwood, almost all the sedums, but just remember sedums are a very good clean type of ground cover and bush, but when they flower, they will attract some bee activity. Another one, Creeping Jenny, Lysomachia. You can try that. It's a great ground cover. Great spiller for spilling over back walls and stuff of pools, or if you have a flowing water feature coming down into the pool and you have some landscaping around it, that would be a good selection. Uh, Manzanita, some lantana, penstemon, obviously boulders and rock cover. Rock doesn't attract much of anything and you can have plant material in and around it and really now reduce a lot of maintenance. Some other perennials that come to mind, salvia, verbena, various types of uh, New Zealand flax, especially the variegated varieties. I really love those. Another one that kind of looks like flax, uh, dianella. Soft tip yucca is a great pool type of, uh, it does get that, it does get that flower head and you can enjoy it for a while and then trim it off before it gets messy. But most of the time they stay a little small, so it's not a big deal. There's a great ground cover that's even walkable. Uh, that's called Daimondia. You can check that out. Gazania, mosses, some of the perennial hibiscus, bird of paradise, hydrangea, maybe some of the geraniums. Those are just some of them I came up with. I mean, I could I could sit there and probably make a bigger list, but my God, you know, you guys have a life, so do I. Now, moving forward, here's something that's on the horizon. And I have seen a lot of YouTube video about this. I had not seen one installed in my former, former practicing area, but the recreational ponds are coming on now. And it's literally, literally, swimming in a natural pond and swimming with the fishes, <laughs> literally. It's uh, six to eight feet deep at various levels, depending on how your construction is. And these ponds are enlarged and constructed, you know, from the koi pond theory, but elements are added. Depth, like I said, six to eight feet deep at the deepest end. Entry points are created and moving water and filtration is placed so you can enjoy a much more natural swimming experience. The rec ponds are created from boulders, rock, gravel, rubber, line, rubber liner, uh, and recirculating filtration for good hygiene and good clarity and a natural healthy water to enjoy rather than a chlorinated and chemicalized water. You can still have fish, you know, swimming around for bottom cleaning and to enjoy that aspect of swimming. It's really a unique experience. With this style of swimming experience, you can landscape much more heavily and create a much more natural greenscape because of the skimming action of the pond itself, its filtration area. It really works out and lends itself to much more uh, thicker plantings, shall we say. Unique features like boulders and jumping rocks can be placed for kids to jump into the water. Waterfalls, not just one, but more than one can be incorporated for sound and ambiance. Then landscape lighting can be incorporated into it too to add evening swimmability, not only lighting up the inside of the pond, but also the surroundings. So you have like safe navigation, walking around on boulder steps and, and other stuff. It, they're really kind of slick. You need to check them out. Go on there. Uh, Aquascape Incorporated, they, they are putting in a few back in the, the Midwest and see what you think. Cost is pretty much comparable to a, an in-ground pool. There's a lot of cost and a lot of labor involved in those things, but uh, boy, are they slick. Well, as far as pool landscapes, pretty much what I have, I know what you're gonna say. Thanks coach, appreciate it a whole little. Just more stuff to ponder and ruminate over now. Hey, it's what I do, you know? get you to think. As always, you know, I'll always be glad to answer any of your questions, respond to any comments. All you got to do is email me, youryardcoach at gmail.com. As always, guys, to your landscape success. Don't forget the website and support us as much as you can. I really appreciate it. Take care. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Yard Coach Podcast. 
don't forget to head over to the website at youryardcoach.com where you will find more DIY landscape education, including the free 15-step DIY landscape checklist, Coach Matt's ebook called Landscaping Simplified, and the flagship digital course, Homescape 1.0. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can email Coach Matt directly at youryardcoach at gmail.com. We'll see you right here next week.